Hello, I'm Nigel Burford, Sales Manager for Protometer in the UK, Europe, Middle East and Asia. I've been working with a few flooring guys recently, so I thought I'd put together a short presentation to show how Protometer moisture meters need to be used uh, in flooring. Now, when I say flooring, I actually mean subflooring. So this is all about measuring the moisture or excess moisture in subfloors. But first of all, let's take a look at what happens when you have excess uh, moisture in subfloors. So in this example, uh, we've got some mould and staining. And here with wood, uh, the moisture can come up from underneath and actually lift the, the coating, either a wax or a varnish, off the wood. And you see it's caused like a and a white kind of emulsion finish here, which has really destroyed the, um, the flooring finish. And adhesives can fail as well. So if the moisture comes up underneath the adhesive, it can attack the interface between the adhesive and the cement uh, below and make it loose. Wood is an interesting one. Um, so you can see here that it has warped and also the wood has got fatter. So wood, um, when it expands due to moisture, it will expand quicker across the grain than it will um, in line with the grain uh, and as you can see here it's actually used up all the gap between the sheets of wood and sort of pushed up. Also with wood um, any stress that's locked in during manufacturing and drying um, once it'll actually come out and cause the wood to twist and warp once the water gets in there. Also blistering this poor guy has found some bubbles under his vinyl flooring and um, made some holes and surprise surprise you've got some small fountains coming out and then staining and distortion. So for carpets especially, um, they can start to change shape, either shrink or sort of get baggy in places. And obviously the stains come through, which can also cause mold as well um, after a time. So I've put together a, a timeline example here to show what might happen if a commercial flooring fails. So first of all, someone might come in to do an inspection on the floor and then you'll get some report saying that it's failed. So you'd have to close your factory or shop, uh, send everybody home, remove and store your stock, remove and store your fixtures and fittings somewhere, take up the flooring and the adhesive, so get it back to the original subfloor, and then you'd have to dry that floor out. Right? And depending on where the water came from, if there's a leaky damp proof membrane um, or a leak somewhere else, you might need to seal that floor as well. And then you would come in once it's dry enough, do the new floor covering, put that down, refit the fixtures and fittings, get the stock in and then reopen. And that uh, has been a total of 61 days closed in this example, which would be a disaster for many businesses. OK, and some of the costs of that would be attributed to the contractor. Um, you'd have the storage for all your fixtures and fittings and your goods, the removals costs, uh, materials for the new flooring. Uh, wages so you might have employees sat at home doing nothing but you might have to still pay them and then the loss of earnings um, from the business itself so the question is going to be who pays for all that and as a flooring contractor you want to make sure you've done your job properly so you can demonstrate that it hasn't failed um, because of something you haven't done right okay and that's really what this presentation is all about also, um, these days with the online sort of ratings uh, websites like Trustpilot, Review Centre and Checker Trade, um, it doesn't take much for your profile there and your reputation to be uh, destroyed if um, a large and significant flooring situation has a problem. So let's take a look at what happens when a new subfloor is laid. So Remember that a newly poured subfloor is going to be a homogeneous or an even mixture of aggregate bonding agent, cement and water. So when you look at the structure, wherever you look, it's going to have the same mixture of water, aggregate and bonding agent. OK, it's going to be there in the same amounts. So if you were to come along with a drill on the day that it was poured and make some holes at different depths and take moisture measurements, you'll find that, that moisture content would be the same wherever you looked. And let's say for argument's sake, that's going to be 100% relative humidity. Now, remember here that we've laid this concrete floor onto a damp proof membrane. So the bottom surface is sealed and only the top surface is going to be open for evaporation. OK, and then if you come back to that situation a few months later, make those same um, depth moisture measurements, you'll find there's going to be a gradient of moisture content so right at the bottom there you'll have high levels of moisture whereas at the top um, where 
air is more available to take the moisture away, um, you will have a lower moisture content. So let's say we measure that and get 75% relative humidity. You might then check in the paperwork from the flooring, uh, the floor covering manufacturer and realize that your floor is now safe and dry enough to fit your vinyl flooring. So let's go ahead, put our adhesive down, fit our vinyl flooring. Now what you've done there, by fitting that vinyl flooring, you've now sealed this top surface. So if you go away and then come back a few months later and take some more moisture measurements at different depths, what you'll find is that the remaining water in the slab has redistributed itself and has raised this moisture level at the top surface. So you might measure that and find that it's 90. So that is now gonna be above the safe limit for laying your floor. So this is something we need to be really careful of. And in general, um, if the subfloor is open, it can take years for that water at the bottom levels to find its way out to the top um, and for that slab to reach a condition of equilibrium or uniform moisture content. So some things to be uh, careful of then, we need to be aware that moisture level readings taken at the top surface of a floor slab might not represent the true condition. It might not show you what's going on um, a few millimetres or a few inches down. Um, so what we need then are a variety of tools or test methods um, to take those measurements so we can reliably know what's going on in that floor. Also, um, different types of materials and different substrates will have different drying rates and characteristics. So it's always a good idea to get that information from the supplier of those materials. Also here I've put some different examples of how drying can take place. So this is the example we looked at just now. Um, on this example, this might be a mezzanine floor um, where you've got both top and bottom surfaces are available for air drying. And what you'd find here is your highest humidity would be on the center line of that slab. In this one, we've covered both the top and the bottom surfaces. So your moisture is going to be uniform wherever you look in that slab after a time. Um, on this example, it's basically um, we've covered the top but the bottom surface is open. So you get sort of the inverse of this example here. And then with this example, we've got air available to take um, water away from the top surface, but the bottom surface has got some semi-permeable barrier. So you get some kind of skewed relationship here and your highest moisture content would be kind of off center towards, um, towards the bottom here. So the question is then at what moisture level can we fit the floor covering and, and what we're talking about here is a safe air dry condition in concrete and the British standard uh, 8203 details all of this and basically tells you that 80% um, is the limit so anything drier than 80% relative humidity is fine however they also give us a sort of a factor of safety or a bit of headroom on that so the advice is really to aim for 75% relative humidity or less. But how can we measure it? So how can we measure that and be confident? And also more importantly, how can we provide the proof that that floor was dry enough before you uh, fitted the flooring? So there are several different types of moisture meter and I'll start with pin meters. So pin meters are actually measuring the resistance of a sample um, and they are calibrated in units of percentage wood moisture equivalent. So it's actually calibrated for wood. And when used with wood, the reading you get here is actually the percentage moisture content in that wood. You can use them on concrete and other materials, but it, it will not give you a calibrated result, but they are still very good for getting an indication and a, or a comparative measurement. And because they only touch the surface, you're only really working at the surface and uh, no deeper than that. And you've got to be aware that there may be some salts or other con conductive materials in the sample that you're testing. And this will artificially raise the moisture um, result that you get. The next type of moisture meter is a non-invasive or RF type moisture meter. And what these do is these emit a field of radio frequency energy, which is partially absorbed by the sample and the moisture in that sample and you get a reading uh, between zero and 999, which is not calibrated in any units, but it tells you how much moisture is in that sample. And they also provide a subsurface 
relative measurement. So because there's a, a field emitted from this sensor head here, it actually goes below the surface, which is really useful. Um, they are best used really to give you a sense of change between one position and another, um, and also a change over time. And they can be used to check for uneven drying. So if you have a room, for example, with a new floor in, and you maybe have a stagnant air situation in one corner, um, you could use this to check that and then intelligently reposition your drying equipment, for example. Um, they're good on decorative finishes because unlike the pin meters, there's no risk of scratching up the surface. Uh, but these can also be influenced by other things uh, in the sample that you're checking. So if you've got cables, any studs, uh, nails, screws or um, pipe work in there, this will uh, pick you up and could give you pick, you pick it up and could give you a false reading. Um, but it's important to note that both RF meters and pin type meters are not unapproved. Uh, not approved by any British standard for flooring. So this brings us nicely to our next method of measurement, which is equilibrium relative humidity measurement or ERH. So here we've got our humidity box and this is a, a piece of foam and underneath there's a hollowed out section. And what we do is we put our temperature humidity, pro humidity probe in here and leave it in situ for 72 hours. And what happens is the air pocket that's trapped under there um, become, comes into equilibrium in terms of humidity with the surface of the concrete there. Then after 72 hours, you'd come back, plug in your meter and then take your temperature and humidity reading. And the use of this is actually prescribed in the British Standards for Flooring uh, floor fitting tests at 8201, 8203 and 5325. So if you follow that procedure using this device, you will have a solid reading and a good record of that floor condition, which will stand up in court. So those are the basic modes of operation. And I just want to show you on this slide how those modes or functions are mixed in the products. So on the left hand side here, we've got the digital mini, which is purely a pin type meter. Um, and then here we've got the Aquant, which is purely an RF type, a non-invasive type meter. And we've combined those functions in our Survey Master. Um, so this product would be used typically by somebody uh, like a surveyor or somebody doing a home buyer survey where they can go in and quickly assess a property for the risk of moisture ingress or mold um, or damp problems. And then we have the Hygro Master 2. So on here we have a temperature humidity probe. We also have a non-contact thermometer uh, with a laser pointer aim, and so we can do dew point measurement of surfaces as well. Uh, and this can do psychrometry and hygrometry. And we've combined all those functions in our multi-measurement system or MMS products. And this is the MMS2, which has been selling for a number of years now. And we're just about to launch our MS, MMS3, which is our next generation product. And this is fully equipped with Bluetooth, um, which uh, can be used to interface with the mobile phone app, which we produced for both iOS and Android. And you can use those apps to actually control and drive these devices. But more importantly, um, you can automate all your reporting and collect all the data, including photos, um, and save them to the cloud. Uh, that makes reporting a lot more easier. So that's just one of the benefits or improvements on the MMS3. There's a few others. So the batteries have a longer life, um, for example, and there's many other improvements on this product. So how would it work then? So how would a typical MMS investigation work? So first of all, you go into a situation and you want to quickly find relatively high regions of moisture. So you could do that using RF mode. Then once you find that, you could use the pins, for example, especially if it's a wood floor to confirm that high reading and actually record uh, calibrated measurements. You might then want to also drill some holes and use pin mode with an extension or one of these accessories here to get measurements at depths. And then you could start to identify if you've got a moisture gradient in your subfloor. And the probes used here are our deep wall probes. So these are actually insulated all the way up to the contact point here. Once you've found the position on the floor with a relatively high moisture content, you could then come along with your MMS2 um, or Hygromaster and then do a full hygrometry measurement there or humidity measurement using the uh, 
um, humidity box. Also, you could drill some holes at different depths and use the probes there with the humidity sleeves. And that would help you to build up this uh, picture of sort of moisture uh, with respect to depth. So the MMS flooring kits, uh, they come um, with all these um, accessories. You've got five calibrated hydro sticks, hydro sticks which come with a calibration certificate. There's also a, um, a calibration check device here. So this is a little pot with some saturated salt solutions. And what you would normally do is sort of check calibrate um, your hydro sticks um, maybe once every six months. However, I'd recommend that if you're going into check a floor or some kind of litigation um, situation, you might want to do a quick check on the morning that you go in into the um, into the customer's place and record that result as well. So you can prove that your your probe is up to spec later on. Um, there's also um, the humidity sleeves that come with that, and these can be adjustable for depth as well. And also there's a drill in there with a collar so you can set your depth on your drill and a wire brush to clean the hole out. So what are the use cases then for MMS? Um, so before the flooring fitment, you want assurance and the proof that the subfloor is dry enough uh, and in accordance with standards and with the limits uh, uh, provided by the manufacturer of your flooring materials. Also, after fitment, if you get a problem, you can go back and check that your floor is still dry um, just to get rid of any sort of um, blame on you as the flooring contractor. Also, if there's a problem with the floor, you can use the MMS products to really track down and do your investigation to see where that water is coming from. Another product which has been really useful for flooring guys is our new ReachMaster Pro. So what we've done here, we've mounted a RF uh, sensor on the end of a telescopic uh, stick and um, the readouts on the other end and these communicate via Bluetooth and if you use one of these then you'll have a reduced need for using ladders but also you'll save your hands and knees um, in the in the flooring world by um, not having to crawl around so these are really useful for that. Um, also the the energy uh, emitted here by the sort of RF field is quite high so we've allowed we we're able to go up to 12 centimeters deep um, when searching for moisture, which is really useful. Uh, and the battery life is 80 hours as well. So that's a really good um, tool for the flooring guys. Um, so thanks for watching that. Please check out the Protometer website. Uh, we've rebuilt the website recently, so it's got simpler navigation. There's a distributor finder there, so you can find your nearest distributor very simply. Um, there's links to a lot of explainer videos there. And also uh, for every product, um, there's the manuals that can be easily found and also any firmware upgrades as well. So I hope you found that useful. Um, I, now I'm not a flooring expert, um, so if I've made any mistakes or if you've got any comments, please put them in the uh, comments below. And um, yeah, thanks for watching. And if you get the chance to check a property for moisture, please don't just moisture check it, protometer it.